Welcome to my YouTube channel, Rick Sorwitz Watercolor. I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, be sure to subscribe and sign up to my mailing list so that you're always getting the latest releases. This is the narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting, Winter Wonder. The photograph on the right was a reference for this painting, and the image on the left is the finished painting, my interpretation of this subject matter. Before I began my painting, I did some problem solving and planning in my sketchbook. These are four of the sketches that uh, eventually became studies. Three of them are value studies that I did with Payne's Gray, and in the bottom right hand corner is a color study. In the end, I decided to go with a more analogous color scheme rather than use this study that I have in the bottom right hand corner. However, the sketchbook is a good place to to test some of these color schemes that you might want to try without having to commit the direction of your painting. This is my pencil sketch done on a quarter sheet, 11 inches by 15 inches. It's a 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. It's actually uh, a much more involved sketch than I often use in my paintings. A lot of times I just draw the major shapes. However, in this one, I drew the major shapes in quite a bit more detail into this initial drawing. One of the things, if you've seen some of my videos I like to do, especially my winter scenes, is to have a little sparkle going on. So I'll take some liquid masking fluid and I'll just splatter it into the trees and a few other places just to give a little sparkle and maybe suggest a, the feeling of some snow blowing around. Just um, it just creates a nice wintry feeling. Not going to use a whole lot, just a little bit here and there, and that's all the masking that I'm going to do on this. Before I begin my painting, I'll go through the colors that I used: ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, royal blue, raw sienna, raw umber, quinacridone burnt orange, quinacridone rose madder, and alizarin crimson quinacridone. I'm going to insert a view of my palette for parts of this video. It won't be for the whole thing, but I know people have asked to see a little bit more of my palette. I show more of my palette in my courses than I do my YouTube videos because my courses are much more involved. But um, I'm going to try to work in some of the, the palette views into some of my YouTube videos. I'm going to begin painting the area in the distance uh, where behind the trees there's some hills that are in shadows with some snow on it and, and there's little bits of uh, the snow showing uh, through the shadows. Uh, but I'm using a mixture here with uh, ultramarine blue, some quinacridone rose matter, and I'm using some raw sienna. So on the right I'm mixing uh, a, a blue tone and a little bit of a purple tone. On the left I've introduced some raw sienna which will neutralize that mixture a little bit. So as I paint this I'm going to be using a combination of uh, some, some colors that are a little brighter, a little more intense leaning towards the blue and purple side and then I'm also going to come in with some mixtures that are neutralized a little bit where I've added some raw sienna and they're, they're grayed down uh, quite a bit. So I'm going to alternate where I bring some of those colors into. And here I'm painting around uh, the trees. This is an area where sometimes I would choose to mask. And right now I'm, I'm painting the, the hills that are behind these trees. And to do that I'm having to paint in between the trees, which is fine. Um, however, another approach to this would be, there's two approaches I could two other approaches that I could take. I could mask these tree shapes and then I'd come in with a, a large brush and just paint these uh, hillsides with some large ex expressive uh, brush strokes uh, that would quickly cover that area and then the trees themselves would be protected uh, for later if I wanted to come in and have some light tones on those trees. The other thing I could do is not mask and still use a big brush and put washes in the background here on these trees just painting through these trees because most of these trees are going to lean towards a very dark value 
and whatever I wash I'm putting on here, if I put that in with a big brush, the, the, the mixture that I would be putting on top of it would just cover it up and you wouldn't even know. Uh, however, for this one I decided to do some uh, painting around and uh, I'm, so I'm using a smaller brush than I might use. And if I were to do this again, I might take the other approach where I didn't use any masking and I just put some big washes down with a large brush. And here you can see that I've uh, just continued to paint alongside these trees. And if I were using the large brush approach where I just came in and, and painted these larger shapes that are in essence behind these trees, it, it would have been accomplished very quickly in a matter of seconds, however, because I, I chose this route. It's a much more involved process. Now I'm going to continue on with this wash alongside these tree shapes. And I'm going to be painting this uh, on the left side. There's a larger uh, hillside. And you can see as I've painted these uh, shapes, if you can see, even though these are little shapes that I'm painting, they're actually uh, a larger shape that's covered, being broken up by these uh, linear tree shapes. But you can see that I've left this light edge that I want to, to be able to see in the shadows that the, there's a, a light edge on the, the tops of these hillsides. So I'm going to continue to paint. I'm going to refer to this as this larger shape, hill shape, behind these trees as I move from left to right. Again, using the same colors, ultramarine blue, quinacridone rose matter, a little bit of raw sienna in there. If you look close here, you should be able to see some areas where uh, it's more of a blue tone, other areas it's more of a, a purple tone, and in some areas it's a gray tone. And uh, these are uh, just uh, one color gradating to the other color, so it's all one wash. Now I'm going to move over to the right side of the composition and I've inserted the reference photo so you can take a look at uh, how this is coming along. You can see that I've painted that dark shape uh, in the top left corner basically painting between these trees and as I said I could have painted that with a large brush and just come over with the darker tones. Originally I was thinking I would have some light edges on the trees but I don't think I'm going to have a lot of them. Uh, so I probably could have gone that way. And uh, here there's a, just a lot of uh, broken up shadowy shapes on the, the side of this hill. If you look close at the photograph, uh, I'm not sure how much of that is going to uh, be visible once I get the final washes down here and, and start to bring out the foreground. but. Um, I'm, I'm trying to show that those patterns of light that are on the side of that hill. And I'm still working with the same colors that I was on the left side. Although I'm not using as much uh, of the gray. Uh, it's more the kind of a light uh, blue-violet. And I'm just painting this with a small round brush. It's a little different than how I uh, often paint. I'm, I'm normally using larger brushes. And uh, as I said, if I'd taken the other two approaches, I would have been doing this with either a one inch or a half inch flat brush. Next, I'm gonna bring some of these colors more towards the, the middle ground and the foreground. As I start to describe some of these shadows, here you have a shadow being cast by the tree shape and uh, at the moment I'm still using uh, the same mixture of, uh, of color that I was using uh, in the background there but it is more uh, along the lines of the, the ultramarine blue and more of a, a red violet uh, mixture and a, and a blue violet mixture so a little stronger edge 
as I get here towards the, the foreground and just picking up this color in, in the shadows. And I add a little bit of raw sienna there and we come back with uh, some of that blue violet and they'll merge together and create a little bit of a neutral there. It gives a nice variation so that it's not all intense color. Here I'm going to paint another shadow. And keep in mind when you're painting these shadows they contour the, the surface that they're cast upon. So they're not all just straight edged uh, shadows. They're not just straight lines. There are times when it's cast on a very flat surface that they're uh, very straight hard edged but in this instance it's going uh, along the terrain. It's being cast along the terrain and it's a very irregular edge. I'm going to reinsert my palette here as I uh, mix another pool of color using the same colors that I've been using, rose matter, quinacridone, and ultramarine blue, and raw sienna. And you can see that I mix big, mix big pools of color. It, to me it's the only way that you can be expressive and make fresh brush strokes and put down fresh washes when you're working with watercolor. If your approach is to take a little dab and, and touch it to a plate, with, take a little teeny tiny brush and add a little water, it, you're just not going to be able to to paint this way. Um, I, I have uh, my wells full of paint and um, I mix big pools of color in my mixing area. I'll add, I'll add quite a bit of water. It's very fluid even when it's a dark value it's still very fluid. That's how I like to work. It's the way I've always worked with watercolor. And um, I like to clean my palette. I'll clean it several times when I'm painting. Uh, once I'm done with a color, I kind of set it up with the colors I'm going to be working with in an area. And then when I want to change, I just spray it, take a tissue, wipe it out, and I start again. And I might come back to this mixture a few times throughout the painting process. But it's just how I like to work. I've added some raw umber, and I'm adding some quinacridone and burnt orange to this mixture. And uh, it's going to make a, uh, a dark, earthy tone. Uh, kind of a warm gray. I'm going to soften that up a little bit, but I'm trying to suggest some of the the underbrush and the branches and saplings and everything that are kind of gathered on the other side of this hillside. I spray that to soften it up. It probably would have been better if I had turned that upside down, getting a lot of that uh, flowing back down. So I think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, rotate my board and come back in and put a little bit more of that earthy tone down and let it come away from the, the edge of the snow. I don't want to lose that edge of the snow. I'm going to come in a little darker value and I'm letting this uh, color run right over the top of the trees because uh, some of these tree shapes are actually kind of behind all of this brush and uh, it doesn't bother me to have this wash over top of them and they're going to be some darker values on those tree shape shapes anyhow. I flipped my board back over and I've dried uh, the paper and now I'm going to start to put in some more of these uh, kind of shadowed shapes. These are These are really what starts to define the various forms throughout the composition. Here you have the edge of the the bank. You have those trees going off of it. And uh, I'm using this round wash brush. Like I said, you can't make these kind of brush marks. Big fluid expressive brush strokes with a little teeny tiny paintbrush that's loaded like you, you put it, uh, dipped it in a tube of toothpaste. It, it just can't get that kind of a fresh flow to your paint. Uh, at least that's that's my opinion. That's, that's why I like to work this way. That's why I have a palette loaded with paint. And I keep it fairly moist. When I'm painting in extended periods I'll mist it with a spray. And when I'm done painting I'll mist it with spray or put a put a half teaspoon of water on it or so if it's starting to get too dry and then I 
put a plastic lid on it. I have a porcelain palette but it has a plastic lid and uh, it keeps it the consistency that I like to work. I'm taking some of this mixture and uh, again this is still some of the shadowed areas of of snow. As you come over that bank there's some some dark earthy colored rocks there that I haven't painted yet and then there's some shadows being cast so I'm continuing with the same mixtures I've been using and I go back and forth from a from a blue to a blue violet to a red violet to to some gray tones um, and working with the same colors and you can see that transition from a more of a blue violet to a red violet In my sketch I provided enough information here to, to kind of guide my brush as I paint some of these uh, small to medium shapes and uh, I'm just uh, continue, continuing on with this wash brush. You can see there's beads of water when I when I get to the end of my brush stroke there's there's enough water in my brush and that I'm putting on that paper that's saturated and there's a bead there that I can lead around and I really don't have to work the brush too hard it basically has to do with the, how I load my brush and my palette and that's another reason when you when you don't uh, make nice big pools of color with, with, with some water in it you can't really load your brush well to the point of where it's saturated and as you touch the paper it just starts to dis, uh, discharge to the paper and it that bead of water actually just coats the paper and it's not so much the the bristles of the brush. I'm going to use this fine mist spray. I find it's a good technique to let some of these colors run and soften the edges. I'm going to insert that palette again and I'm going to mix some colors here for the trees. So I'm starting with cerulean blue you can see again a nice big pool of color still using a uh, wash brush however this one is a, a flat wash brush it's a half inch flat wash brush and I'm going to add some raw sienna a little raw umber and start to mix these colors together with different ratios so the right side will lean more towards the cool side of things and the left will be uh, more warm tones and there I put a little a burnt orange on the left and you can see how that on the right now with the with the uh, warm tones mixed into the cerulean blue how I get kind of a a cool gray I need a little more blue in that take it back I went a little too far you can see now I have a warm and a cool uh, gray tone and on the bottom left there I've had a little bit more um, an orange, some raw, or raw umber, and then I've taken some royal blue and I've added to that on the left, which has darkened that up a bit. So these are some of the colors I'm going to be using as I start to paint these trees. Here I'm just loading up my half inch flat brush and I'm just dragging it down uh, painting the, the tree trunk. And now you can see why if I had chosen to I could have um, just paint it over these areas and come back over them with a darker valued wash. So as I paint these I'll alternate where I'm uh, grabbing for the mix for the, the mixture that I'm applying to the paper and I'll, I'll move it around from warm to cool and then I'll also um, some edges will be a little darker than others but this is just a half inch flat square flat wash brush I've got a lot of these to paint so I'm gonna uh, just move from one to the other and I'll just be changing the mixture I'm using but I'm not going to show every tree that I'm painting here you can see this is a is leaning a little bit more towards a warm tone 
And if you look close, you can see some variance between uh, the tones that are being used and subtle value shifts if you look from the left to the right. But it's very subtle. Now this is a cooler mixture that I just put down. Here again, just a half inch flat brush. It's a little warmer at the bottom. So you, you, can, you just can use your, your half inch flat brush and get a lot of, of variety in the brush stroke just by turning the angle uh, of the edge of the brush as it relates to the paper. I can get a, a wider mark or I can get a narrow mark depending on how I angle the brush or twist turn the brush. Now I'm going to want to get a little darker here. Now I'm going to mix in a little lizard and crimson with the raw umber and that'll give me a, a deep rich warm earthy tone. So when I'm when I'm going with a dark value earth tone I'll I'll normally uh, I'll often say I'll use raw umber as kind of the base and then I'll add uh, alizarin crimson if I want to be a bit of a warm rich dark tone and if I want to be a, a cool dark tone I'll uh, use some royal blue another thing I can do is take some of that burnt uh, the quinacrin and burnt orange and mix it with some of the royal blue and that'll that'll drive the blue towards an earthy tone and, and make it the mixture more of a neutral earthy mixture. So there's a lot of activity in this background here that I haven't put in yet and there's a lot of saplings, a lot of branches and uh, I want to have uh, uh, some, some, some narrower marks here, linear marks. So I'm going to use a, uh, a liner brush here. This is a number six liner brush. I'm going to get rid of that palette picture. I'm going to put in the uh, reference photo. So when I'm painting uh, a backdrop like this where I have all these saplings and branches and all this activity uh, back there, I don't try and render the, each little branch and sapling I see in the photograph. It's more a suggestion of the activity I see back there, of the, the, the direction, the action, the shapes, the movement, what's going on back there. And, um, while I look at the photo just to get a feeling of the direction and the, the size and the angles of some of these and the length and where they're overlapping and, and, and uh, how they're being broke up, I, when, I, when I paint them I'm just, just very suggestive recreating the, the patterns and the textures rather than trying to copy the, the image. Now I'm going to start to uh, change some of the direction of some of these marks and I'm actually I've switched to a number one liner brush so it's a thinner brush, a, a thinner mark that I'm making. So now I'm suggesting saplings and branches that are that are leaning over, that are bent. The other thing I want to do is I want to get a contrast of line so I have these very straight tree and saplings and those those very linear shapes that are uh, very straight and vertical um, but I'm starting to contrast some of those with uh, lines that are going at an angle uh, lines that aren't straight but have some arc and some curve to them so those start to contrast the very straight vertical lines of the tree trunks and by doing so you start to get some depth and um, one of the things that's good to do is if you can accomplish this while you're, uh, everything's wet, so when the trunk's wet and you put the branches over, because actually when you see in the distance, you don't see as much separation between things. You see them more as one tangled kind of shape, but um, you, you don't necessarily see all the separation between 
a branch that's going over a tree, they they kind of take on the same kind of middle value tone sometimes. And um, if you paint them when they're all wet, they just kind of link together naturally. And it's kind of how you see things when they're in the distance, trees at least. Now I'm going to start to bring uh, some of these brush marks forward more towards the middle ground and foreground. Uh, they're still linear marks. They're representing some of the saplings and sticks and branches and things that are sticking out of the ground. And these, these marks start to help to create some spatial relationships. You can do it with value, they do it with overlap and positioning where they, where they sit on the ground. Um, coming up here on this case on the other side of the edge that helps validate the edge and then here's some some uh, little saplings that are coming more towards the foreground so the positioning in this case helps start to uh, create spatial relationships when you start to see a grouping of saplings on the on the edge of a hill that just starts to helps to validate that that's the edge of a hill and then you you have some that are over top of that and they're they're uh, closer to you in the foreground and as a relationship to the others and here i'm just painting this kind of a fallen branch or something that's uh, leaning down into the snow off the, the the edge on the left there now i'm going to take a dark value that's some royal blue a little raw umber a little quinacrid and burnt orange and it makes this dark value that uh, I'm going to use again to show some of the some of the branches and saplings but I'm also going to use this to start to paint some of these areas on the edge where pieces of rock are showing through it could be just a, a, a corner of a rock it could be the side of a rock and uh, that you know, if this snow wasn't here that that bank would be all rock so as you make these you try and be aware of direction too when you make these brush marks and and try to use them to contour the form of something when you can the snow has this area covered up pretty well but there's pieces of rock just sticking through and like i said it could just be the the corner just the, the end of a rock a little bit showing through um, in other areas there's just an, a, a fairly sizable area because of the angle that may be uh, facing very vertical and the snow hasn't, isn't accumulating on it. Um, but just looking and putting some touches of this value to give the suggestion of these very dark um, rocky areas coming through. I know often people are very worried about uh, the colors being used and they want to know every color and, um, and it's not a bad thing but uh, often we, we forego value for color and rather than worrying about which color is being mixed on the palette you should pay more, as more attention to the value that's being mixed and, and where you're using it and how you're creating value patterns in your composition the the uh, if you have your value right i don't say the color doesn't matter but it, it, it really doesn't the color doesn't define form value defines form and you can have all kinds of wonderful colors but if you're not creating a good value structure it's not going to be a strong painting so um i, I understand the the desire to to see every little mix that's created but one of the best ways to do that is to experiment and practice but pay particular attention to the values being used uh, the, this dark area I'm painting right now this could be leaning towards a blue color, a purple color, an earthy color uh, a deep red and it would still be as effective as long as the value is right but if the value is not right it doesn't really matter what color I'm using so pay particular attention to the value before you start worrying about uh, color. As I start to get closer to the foreground, 
and uh, you can start to, to have a see have a little bit more definition on these rocky uh, uh, ledges edges here along the the bank. Um, you can start to use uh, your brush stroke to help define the the direction. If you look at um, some of the vertical or angular brush strokes that I've made here, as they relate to to the left side where I'm defining where there's breaks in the ice, and you see that dark dark water, those are horizontal. While some of these brush strokes are are vertical, so you can say a lot with the uh, with the direction that you apply your paint using your brush strokes, um, you want to be expressive with your brush and let it let it do some of the work. Here I'm going to continue to make uh, uh, give an indication of where some of these rocky shapes are peeking through. As I was discussing about color and value, for me, if I think about priorities, I prioritize value first, then I think about uh, color temperature, then intensity, and then I worry about hue. So those are the things that I prioritize when I'm painting. I, I make sure that I'm addressing uh, the value of my composition, that I have a, a plan from a value structure. And then I think about warm and cool colors and, and where they're going to be placed and what's going to be dominant. And then I start thinking about the intensity of those colors. And then I worry about the hue. This uh, this dark value here is a very dark value next to some of these whites and lights. And one other thing that's starting to develop here is the contrast that's here in the foreground is very much like the contrast that's in the middle ground. I have some of these very dark darks against some of the, the, the white of the paper in, in all these areas. And um, uh, you can see here I'm getting very strong contrast which will be okay. I want the, I want to lead you into the light. So what I'm, I'm going to end up doing here is not lighting lightening the value that I have here in the foreground on the right but uh, lessening the contrast. So I'll do that by coming in with a darker wash and I'll have less contrast between those dark shapes and, and those other areas that are right now a very much a light, light middle wash. So I'm going to take a mixture using these same colors that I use in this area, but uh, a darker value. So by play, applying this wash over this area, I'm losing some of those areas that are, are very light value. And I'm, by doing that, I'm lessening the contrast so it doesn't draw you in as much. It's not competing with some of these areas uh, to the left and towards the top left there when I want you to, to really be uh, focused on. So I'm gonna bring this wash down it just really I'm just strengthening this sh this area in terms of shadow and putting it in, in shadow uh, but a, it's a deeper value and it's a combination of a blue violet and a red violet and I'm going to take a little bit of that value down along the bank while the, the wash on the right has helped tone down the contrast between the rocky areas and the, and the snow I'm actually going to strengthen the shadow here on the left and I'm going to increase this contrast to kind of help draw you more into this area of the picture. Now I'm going to go to the background here. I actually want the, this area to be more of a, a dark middle value than where it's at right now. So I'm going to uh, take that wash and glaze over this area in the background. I still don't want to lose the edge of the hills that are kind of illuminated in the distance, but um, just glazing over the, the work that I've done there just to help push that back a little bit. So I've uh, reduced the contrast in that area on the, on the right 
and the area in the background there to really start to focus you in on those those areas where the light's coming through and uh, I want to take a darker color here in these areas where the water is coming through the ice um, because it all, it all kind of it looks a little too much the same so I'm coming in with a dark value here that's kind of a royal blue mixture and just indicating where this this water is still um, exposed uh, within the around the edges of the snow and the ice there and as I come forward here I'm going to soften this edge a little bit and lose some of that definition I'm just going to take the spray bottle and soften that up and hopefully that that your eye can follow that dark value in with some of those hard edges and the contrast and just lead you back into the into the light so here I'm gonna take some darker values and go on the on some of these trees again I want them to be a little a little darker than what they are so these will be mixtures of royal blue and raw umber and some raw umber with alizarin crimson just depends if I want to lean a little bit towards warm or a little bit towards cool it doesn't really matter to me so much what what colors I'm using as long as I have the temperature that I'm after and the value so these are very dark values and keep in mind here that when, before I even started to paint at all I took a, a toothbrush and did a light splatter of some uh, liquid masking fluid on this surface so I'm going to reach a point here where I, I lift that off and you'll see some of that, that, that sparkle, that splatter uh, coming through. Right now as I paint some of these areas and these dark values you see some variation is being created because of the resist of the masking fluid. So here again going darker with values on these trees. I'm going to do the same here on the right on these trees here. Bring them, uh, just make them feel like they're right there in the foreground or more the middle ground I guess but um, I don't want them to get lost uh, in the trees that are in the distance there because they're kind of the same tone and value so by going darker I start to to make those feel like they're they're more uh, towards the middle ground towards the foreground less in the distance There's some very wiry saplings, young saplings here and there scattered about. So I'm going to uh, put a few of those in and, and strengthen a couple of the ones that I had already had in there with a little darker or value again. Put a dark tone here on this stick that's kind of fallen in. Well, I have gone darker. I, I still have very light values after it's all dried between this this foreground and the middle ground. So I'm going to go even darker here in the foreground in the snow. These are the shadowed areas of the snow, but they're the closest to you. So I'm taking this kind of a rich dark mixture of ultramarine blue, royal blue, a little raw sienna in it. And I'm going to want to bring some of this value over to the to the left side of the composition too. So we're going to get the side of this snow covered rock with this darker tone and uh, I'm going to bring a little bit more of that up into 
uh, to represent a few shadows. I'm going to take it across still to the left side there and strengthen this shadow here just a little bit. I want to reveal a little bit more where this water's at. In my actual photograph, this area is very light. I was reflecting light, it gets lost. So I'm going to darken that value so there's more of a separation between where the water's at and where the, the snow and ice are. And you just want to, I'm just going to follow this value back into the, the to that uh, grouping of trees on the left kind of in the top left corner there. I'm back to my number one rigger here with a dark value and I'm just putting some even smaller uh, linear, ele linear elements here in the composition just to just to suggest some some of the grass and twigs that are sticking up and it just creates a little another layer of interest. So I'm just moving about. And if you look at the photo, there's there's these little pieces of little pieces of branch and twig that are just kind of sticking through the snow here and there. Because in the and the, when there's no snow here, there's a lot of plant life here on the shore. While a lot of it's covered and weighted down, there's sticks and twigs and uh, little branches that stick through the snow. I'm going to take a small round brush loaded with some paint. I'm just going to tap it on my hand just to create some splatter. This is going to be a dark valued splatter. And this is going to uh, work in conjunction with the masking fluid that I splattered. So when I remove that, I'm going to have this textural quality uh, here and there. That some are going to be light value and some are going to be uh, dark value, but they're going to complement each other because it's going to be repeating that texture and just create some interest. I'm also going to take some of that and just splatter a little bit up into the trees. So there's, there's just, I like the textural qualities you get with some of these splatter techniques and I, I, I like the, the kind of sparkle when we remove this masking fluid. Again, these two will work together. Now I'm going to use the rubber cement pickup eraser and I'm going to remove the dried masking fluid that I applied earlier. And as I do, you can start to see that kind of white sparkle start to show where the white of the paper has been preserved. And now I have the combination of texture of the, of the light texture splatter from the masking fluid and some of the dark splatter from tapping my paintbrush. So the two create an interesting texture and pattern of splatter throughout. And I, and I like this masking technique to give me this rather than use opaques. It's just the way I like to paint. I like to save the white of the paper and I don't mess with white paint or any, any gouache or anything. So it requires planning ahead, uh, but it's a technique that I like to, to use. And now where I had some of that white, there's little touches of some leaves hanging on, some dried orange leaves. So I'm going to just take a little of that wash and just touch a few areas and I'm going to make a few accents with that color here and there around the composition so that there's a better balance and I want to have about just isolated in one spot on the painting. It doesn't have to be much, just a touch to kind of offset what's going on up in the trees. Now I have my quill brush and I have a dark value on there, dark blue and this raw umber. And I'm just making some uh, some marks with some line to help describe some of these edges, help clean up some of the edges and and just better define uh, the relationship where where some of these surfaces change and create an edge and, and line is a good good way to do this. A lot of times uh, using line gets overlooked I think it's a it's an important design element. There's a couple rock shapes in the in the distance here that I want to have a little better definition on. So I'm going to take a, a dark wash and, and just bring those out a little bit more. There we go. 
maybe a little hard edge. I'm going to take a uh, uh, tissue and just blot those just to soften them up a little bit. Now I'm going to put a white mat on this to frame it up, get a good look. And there you have my painting, Winter Wonder. If you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe to my channel and join my mailing list by clicking on one of the boxes on the screen.